<clears throat> okay, what we are going to do now is instead of solving exactly this SDP, I'm going to go to a slightly different SDP, which will give us the same information as the other one needed, namely whether lambda is positive or negative. But by adding this constraint, it's much easier to go to the standard form. Okay, so I will not give you a standard form of this SDP, not, not now, not later, but I will give you a standard form of an SDP that is very close to this one and does the same job. Okay, and this is the SDP, which is the same. So you want to maximize lambda, you want, you know, some entries of the matrix M, you want M minus lambda one to be positive. And in addition, you assume lambda itself to be non-negative. Now you might say, why is that Why is that a good idea? Because the goal is to understand whether lambda is positive or negative, and now we require that lambda is non-negative. Well, if lambda was negative in the first place, then it would, of course, contradict this condition. And the output of the new program would then be, it's infeasible, right? So that gives us the information that lambda is negative. Okay, so lambda being negative of the old program would now be, this is infeasible. And we get the same amount of information necessary to us. And we don't get the value of lambda, but we get the same, we get the same uh, information that we need. Okay, so, um, yeah. How does that relate to a composition of this bit? Because is, is it, for instance, easier to compute if you know that you have solutions? Uh, in this case, it's, computational complexity is the same. So it's essentially polynomial time algorithms that, that solve your SDPs. That's why they are considered to be efficient, yes. And, and computational complexity is uh, anyway always only, uh, well, always not, but in practice, in, in most of the cases when people speak about computational complexity, they speak about the asymptotic case. Um, and this is a very specific problem. So depending on the prefactors, which are omitted in the asymptotic case. And the answer is much more difficult. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good. So, so we, um, let's work with the modified as STP. And that's the STP with the green addition. Um, and we know that lambda greater than or equal to zero, if that's the output, then um, it will be as before. So we cannot say whether the correlations are quantum or non-quantum. And if the other option would be that it's infeasible, and this corresponds to uh, lambda being smaller than zero before. So here we know that we have a certificate of non-quantumness. Okay, so we slightly changed the problem and the meaning of the answers, but essentially um, we know as much. Okay, any questions up, up to this point? Then let me start to to define um, to define these x, a, b, and phi. Um, so, um, the reason why I asked lambda to be non-negative as well is because, after all, the goal is to have a, a definition of x such that x must be a non-negative positive semi-definite or non-negative matrix. And before, lambda uh, was not necessarily non-negative. It could be anything. We were going to find out what it's going to be. So I could not give lambda as a diagonal entry of a matrix that, that is supposed to be positive semi-definite. Now that I added this assumption, I can do so. And this is essentially why, why I went uh, with this, um, with this uh, sort of slight change. So I choose my matrix X to be a block diagonal matrix of M minus lambda identity. So that is a, a matrix of the size of M, right? Um, zero vectors here and here. And then I just add another diagonal value lambda. 
And now asking for x to be positive semi-definite is the same as asking for lambda to be non-negative and this matrix to be positive semi-definite. Okay. So, yeah, maybe I should. So this is good because x uh, positive semi-definite is equivalent to um, m minus lambda identity, positive semi-definite, and lambda non-negative. Okay, now I need to define my other matrix A, because A is supposed to extract lambda, and that's easy, right? A, so it's the definition here. And A is now defined as the block diagonal matrix of the zero matrix here, some zero vectors here and here, and the one in the uh, lower right corner. Because that way, we will get trace of AX is exactly equal to the objective function lambda. Good. So we have covered the objective function. We have covered the positive semi-definite constraint. What is left is the linear constraints, in particular, the phi and the b. And I'm not going to construct phi explicitly, but I'm going to tell you why it's obvious that phi can be, or why it's obvious that it can be constructed and essentially giving you a recipe of how to, how to do it. So, We are left with constructing phi and, and defining B. Um, <clears throat> so the first question is, and um, I, I would like to split this split up this question in, into two. So it, after all, the linear constraints are only constraints about M. Nothing about lambda is there. So the first question is, can we extract M in a linear manner from X? And once we have done so, that that would be sort of the first part of this mapping. Once you have extracted M, the next thing you will do is you extract all the known um, coefficients of M, which you then ask to be equal to the known coefficients that are given by your conditional probability distribution. That is the strategy. And the first step is easy, and the second, the first step can be done explicitly. The second, I could also do explicitly, but it's a bit more tedious to do so. So I sort of convince you that this is definitely possible, <laughs> and, and, and then we leave it at that. OK. Um, good, so first, extracting m from x and of course all in a linear manner um, define um, the linear mapping let's call it phi prime and it takes phi prime takes a matrix of the size of x and we can always write this matrix in this block form right you have a block of x1, x11, which is of the size of m. And then you have a vector x12. And so that's a, a, column, uh, yeah, a column vector and a row vector x21. And then you have another entry here, x22, which is a scalar. So I can, I can make this um, precise. So here, so this is a, a block of the size of M, right? These guys are appropriate row and column vectors. And x22 is a scalar. By the way, the same is true for A, exactly like it's here, right? A is written in exactly the same form. Um, so, and we find we define phi prime to be the mapping that essentially takes this block matrix x1, x11, and it adds x22 times the identity of the, of the size of m to it. That's definitely a linear function. Um, it's also a hermeticity preserving function for, yeah, also for quite, quite obvious reasons. Um, 
And um, yes, so, so we can define it as such, because then if you now apply this to X of this form, what you will get is exactly M. Okay, so we have extracted in a linear and hermeticity preserving manner, we have extracted M from our variable X. That is the first step. Um, good, and now the, the, the next step is to, to understand that getting M, knowing M, it's now only all linear constraints. Um, well, and, and the, these linear constraints can be captured by another function of phi, say, double prime that does the job. So how can we, can we do this? Uh, so in extracting known entries. So essentially, the goal is um, to define by prime of M such that we get another matrix that contains the known entries plus maybe some zeros potentially. Okay. And so this, this extracts, um, for instance, um, it certainly should extract M11, M12, M21, and so on. But then M22, well, oh no, we knew that too, okay. Assuming that we have, uh, have uh, pure states and projective measurements. But then M33 is maybe not known, okay. So, so here you would just uh, put this one to a zero. Okay, and so on. And then you ask this to be equal to the matrix B, which you define as the matrix corresponding to the arrangement that you have here, but now with the known entries given by the conditional probability distribution. So this would be one, this would be PA given X zero, zero, this would again be, and so on. And if you have a zero here, then it would just be zero. Okay, so you, because you want these guys to coincide. Now, this is a linear uh, map, obviously. Is it also hermeticity preserving? Um, in fact, the, the only thing that we want to be in this matrix is anyway real. So hermeticity reduces to symmetry. So here, that, that's maybe an important comment here, hermeticity. reduces to symmetry. Okay. And we can, of course, arrange the, um, these guys in a symmetric way. We just ask that this matrix, so whatever comes out here is not just containing all the known entries and maybe zeros, but it's also symmetric and we can do this. Um, okay. So that's a, uh, Easily done. I think by the way I've started, it's already done. So the way I've started is actually the right way of doing it. Now, before I clean, let me maybe continue here. So the punchline is you will then define phi to be first phi prime followed by phi double prime and B as I as I as I as I as I've shown it up there. And then we have defined all the ingredients. And by construction, this is exactly doing the same as our modified semi-definite program um, with the additional constraint that lambda is non-negative. So we do that, and then by construction, this is both an STP in standard form and it solves the same problem as the modified. Okay. 
SDP, which is still the one in green. Just gonna highlight this again by underlining it. Is that clear? Are there any questions about this? Is there any symmetry showing up in the entries that we do not know to make it easier to calculate extraction or I mean, not want them or did I really go for it to pick them out, make a rank one matrix to suspect it or Okay, question is, is there any symmetry showing up in the unknown entries of M? Um, I don't think we require this to be the case. Okay, thinking of the definition of M, assuming that it's a quantum model, um, symmetry would amount to say that at least on the support of the state, the two operators commute, so AI and AJ, right? Because I, I and J are the indices of the matrix and, and symmetry would be the same as you can sort of flip them. Um, and we never required this. So given two projective measurements, you wouldn't require that two projective, two projectors of two different measurements commute. You probably wouldn't require that. Um, But saying that, now it seems to me like we're implicitly assuming that, that M is symmetric or at least her mission nevertheless, right? By saying that M is essentially a part of, of, this, um, of this X, it's a block in X minus an identity, okay, so it stays uh, her mission. So we are sort of imposing it. It's actually a good question. Maybe, so at some point, at some point, there must be an argument why we can assume M to be her mission. Yeah. It's real matrix. Um, the known entries are real. M itself, does it need to be real? The entries that yeah. are like belonging to A and B were not calling row wise, but yeah. we kind of uh, edit them. True. Then, then it should be a mission. Good point. So, by construction, it's her mission, but not necessarily real, right? And the known entries are all real. We only know probabilities, these are real numbers. But but the unknown entries are exactly the ones that, that mess around with this commutativity or, in particular, incommutativity. And this is when, when it can get. get um, when you can get a complex value out of it. Okay, I think that's the answer. So M is Hermitian. The known entries are real, which is why here Hermeticity reduces to symmetry just in terms of this linear constraint, which only cares about the known entries, right? But not in general. Mm -hmm. So that, that should be convincing. At least me, I'm convinced now, maybe, maybe you're not yet. Good question. And you're right, of course, um, M is by, by construction, it's a Hermitian matrix, yeah. yeah. Other questions? Okay. Okay, then let's now go back to um, less technical things and more conceptual insights, and in particular to some results on extensions of what we have done yesterday and today. Um, and for this, I'd ask you to um, think of some, well, not explicitly, but of the, of the following situation. <laughs> think of the case, you, you're given some, some correlations and you want to know whether they are quantum or uh, in particular, whether they are non-quantum. You do this procedure that we have done, that we have played through in detail yesterday and you're not getting a certificate of non-quantumness, okay? So that means the only thing you have learned is that the technique that we have applied does not tell you anything about whether they are quantum or not. 
Could you do better than that? Can we somehow enhance the method that has been discussed so that so that um, correlations that are not quantum, but yet without a certificate with the previous method, can we can we find another way of proving that they are non-quantum, or maybe even better, can we find a limit uh, in which we can prove that they are indeed quantum, so we can stop trying to prove they're not quantum? Uh, that that's the goal. And and the answer is yes. This there exist better techniques based on the same idea. And today I'd like to so in the last twenty minutes I'd like to sketch how this how this idea works. I think the main ingredients to understanding why this idea must work are already there from, from yesterday's lecture because they essentially depend on the positivity of this matrix and on the STP that does, that finds out whether a uh, semi positive semi-definite completion exists. It's exactly the same idea. The only thing you change is the set of operators with which you, you define the known entries of the matrix. That's the only thing that changes. And with this, you get what is called a hierarchy of SDPs. So you get a, not only one, but you get a whole set of SDPs and hierarchy. So this is related to a paper by Navasquez, um, Pironio, and Athene, which is why this is called the NPA hierarchy. And um, the reference to, to two of their paper, the first one uh, essentially pitching the idea, the second one proving some very serious results are all linked in the, in, in the script. So you can find it there. The NPA paper is essentially what, what this part of the lecture was based on. Okay, so remember, we defined the operators A1, A2, and so on, to be elements of the following set, either the identity or an operator of Alice's measurements or an operator of Bob's measurements. And I highlighted yesterday that we could think of these as um, all possible sequences of measurement operators of length one or smaller. Smaller being zero, being the identity. Um, <clears throat> and from here, we defined M I J as the trace over rho A I dagger A J. That was that was the definition. Um, good, but one could so giving giving a name to this guy. So let's call him A one. Okay, one for length one or smaller, but we could also um, consider A2 as A1, but additional operators. And now we can essentially add all the, op all the sequences of measurement operators of length two, okay? So that would be EXA times EX prime A prime, so these are all sequences of measurement operators only on Alice's side. We can do the same for Bob's side. So that is identity tensor Fyb times Fy prime B prime. And we might have mixtures. Um, so an operator on A, tensor an operator on B. So that is E, X, A, tensor F, Y, B. So now we have A2, and these are corresponding to sequences of measurement operators of length two or smaller. And so far, this is just a definition. Eh? But obviously, also using this new definition, M can be defined in the, exactly the same way. Eh? And even if you go further, you can uh, go to A3, which would then be A2 plus, you get the idea, right? I can start, but I'm not gonna finish. EXA 
e x prime a prime e x double prime a double prime times identity plus and so on. So you get the idea. Um, and we can also do this for a3 and so on, a4, a5. We, we, I think we now get how these sets A are, are defined. And by construction, independent of N, if you construct M from the set curly A N, M is going to be positive. Because in the proof that M, is, or, or at least positive semi-definite, in the proof of the positive semi-definiteness of M, we never used anything specific about the operators that we used to do it. We only used the fact that, that M was defined as it is. Eh? So in, independent of N, constructing M from this set, um, and if the correlations, the given correlations P, A, B, given X, Y, which leads to the known entries, are quantum, then M is non negative. So this means that. In, instead of only looking at a certificate of order one, which would be the certificate you get with the original set of operators needed to define M, you can define a certificate of order N, which would be a negative value of lambda of the same, uh, of the semi-definite program that I have erased now, unfortunately, um, where the whole procedure is carried out with the set AN. So a certificate of non-quantumness of order n is an optimal value of lambda, which is negative, or in the modified version, the answer, this is infeasible. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's essentially it, right? Obtained from solving the STP. With M defined using A N. Any questions up to here? Yeah. So um, going back to what we have discussed yesterday, the argument was the following. You construct M in, so you assume that M is of this form. You assume that M is of this form. And if you assume this, and you're given some correlations, PAB given XY, you know some entries of M and others you don't. Um, you give these entries as the linear constraints to an STP, trying to find um, the maximum possible minimum eigenvalue of M. And if it's negative, you have proved whatever you do, it can never be um, positive semi-definite. So the correlations that you have given as an input cannot be quantum. And now we do exactly the same argument. We go through exactly the same argument, but we, we M is going to be a bigger matrix. So instead of only these operators, giving rise to the different entries of M, we now have these plus many more, or even, ma even many, many, many more. But the argument still works the same. If the original correlations that you're given, those guys, if they were quantum, then this must be a, non, uh, a positive semi-definite matrix. So if you can prove that it's not a positive semi-definite matrix, whatever way you use to fill in the gaps, then you have proof that the correlations are non-quantum. So it's exactly the same argument. But of course, now there, with, with um, uh, order two or three, there are many more 
unknown entries than before. And there is many more, there's much more freedom for M to potentially become positive uh, semi-definite, like at least in terms of entries. Good. And then if you, in some order N, if you find a negative value of lambda, which proves to you that these correlations are non-quantum, then this is what you call a certificate of order N. Whereas what we have had yesterday would be called a certificate of order one, because there we used A1 as the set to define the known entries of M. Does this help? About this? Okay. So this is essentially just stating the fact that the proof that M is non-negative under the assumption that it is produced from quantum correlations is independent of the actual set of operators that we used. The proof only used the fact that we use some operators. So we can play around with the set of operators that we use to, to, to make the proof that M is non-negative. That is the statement here. That's all. Okay, and and I've already, so now I think it's clear that this may be helpful, but at this point, we don't know whether it's going to be helpful in practice, because it could be that if it's impossible to, to give a certificate of order one, it's impossible to give a certificate of any order. That's a possible result on, before you start investigating this. So why should this help? Um, and the reason why I'm presenting this to you is because it's exactly quite the opposite. If you're unable to find a certificate of order one, you may go to order two, three, and so on. And the main result, which I'm going to write down in a second, is that if your quantum, if your correlations, the given correlations are non-quantum, then you will find at least one certificate of a certain order. It could be so high that you'll never reach it because even though these algorithms are polynomial, if you give an exponential size input, good luck. Um, but, but, but at least in theory, you can always find a certificate of some order if the correlations are non-quantum. And you can also turn this around and say, if the correlations are quantum, then you will not find a certificate of any order, which is not so helpful because you cannot check all the orders in practice. But in theory, at least it's, it's an interesting analytical result that tells you a lot about <laughs> and the structure of the quantum set in different cases. So that is going to be the main result. And um, I'd like to um, write it down explicitly. Yeah. That is true. So you want an intuition? I get, yeah. Um, yes. I'm afraid I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not able to give you a good intuition of why this, why this should actually become more useful when you go to higher orders. Um, but I can think about it. Maybe we can discuss it in a break in a bit more depth. But I mean, I, I, I fully understand your point and I think intuitively that's a first, a good first impression that you have. But the results contradict this intuition. So it's definitely good to try to find it. Do you have, you have a... The, the higher the order, the more degrees of freedom I get in the NTP mm -hmm. because the known entries remain the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and intuitively, I would say the more likely I am to find at least one negative. For the, yeah. yeah, but the goal is not to find at least one negative, but to prove that every 
every matrix, every completion has at least one negative eigenvalue. That is the goal. So that's actually much harder. Um, I'm really running out of time, so I'd like to use the last five minutes to, to state the results. Um, and they are, as announced, they are based on this paper by uh, Navasquez, Ironio and Dathin from 2008. Um, so the first result, I have said it already in words. If the correlations are not quantum, then there exists an order so such that um, the semi-definite program that we use to determine whether there is a certificate will actually output a certificate of, or of this order, right? So of order n. Um, so that's one way of phrasing it. Another one is to say that if P A B, no. So P A B given X Y is quantum if and only if no certificate exists for any order. Okay, um, there is a bit more to be said because so far it's clear that this is interesting but not so useful because in order to certify quantumness, not, not quantumness, but quantumness, um, you would have to go to arbitrary high orders. Um, but in fact, the, the, the authors of this paper, they also present um, conditions for when it's sufficient to only check a finite number of orders. And once you have checked all these orders and you did not find a certificate, you can conclude that the correlations can be of quantum origin. Okay, so there exist conditions for when finitely many um, orders suffice to be checked. And in fact, there do not only exist these conditions, but there exist interesting cases in which all of these conditions are met. So in these interesting cases, you can actually say, what is the boundary of the quantum set with only finitely many of these STPs and not, not the whole hierarchy. And even better, there exist also cases when um, you can prove that, that finitely many orders suffice to be checked. And then this is enough to even construct an explicit quantum model. So you could say, for instance, with this state and this measurement, you can, uh, you can mimic the given correlations. So there exist cases where one can use this technique to construct an explicit quantum model to generate the given correlations P, A, B given X, Y. Okay. So um, I know I'm, I'm one minute late, but I still want to draw this. In terms of the picture that we have started yesterday, we have the no signaling, we have the quantum, and we have the local set. I have emphasized that the technique from yesterday, it somewhat bounds the quantum set, but not tightly so. So this could be order one. And that means you can have, uh, have uh, non-quantum correlations that do not allow for a certificate, right? Or you may have non-quantum correlations that do allow for a certificate. So this is what we have used this uh, drawing yesterday. But now, if you have non-quantum correlations that do not allow for a certificate, you could now go to the second order, which is slightly better. Okay, so maybe now there is a point in here, which 
is non-quantum, obviously, because it's outside of the quantum set, but it does not allow for a certificate of order one, but it does allow for a certificate of order two, and so on. So you can go on. So that hopefully, no, not hopefully, actually. So what I, what I, the result I presented to you is that in the asymptotic limit, if you consider certificates of all orders, you tightly bound the quantum set. This is essentially the result. Okay, so with all orders, You have a tight bound and asymptotically, I have to say, in general, tight bound on Q. Yes, that might not necessarily be the case. Okay, uh, yeah. Good point. It looks like this, but that's not yeah, that's not a feature of the of the drawing that you should take seriously. Good. Um, I'm uh, we have to stop here, but I'm happy to to take questions after the after the lecture. Thanks. <laughs>